Have you ever heard about Mark Kilroy? He's just like any other college kid, letting loose in Matamoros for spring break. But here's where things take a wild turn. He and his buddies are bar hopping. They're having fun when Mark just vanishes into thin air. And let me tell you, when the cops start poking around, they're bracing for some bad news, but they have no clue just how twisted this whole thing is gonna get. Stick around, cause this story, it's about to blow your mind. Let's recap. Mark Kilroy and his three buddies are doing spring break in Matamoros, Mexico, like hundreds of other college kids. But then they hit that point, you know, the one where they're just, they're done. It's time to head back to Texas. So they regroup and start weaving their way through the sea of party goers. They're all thinking the same thing. Let's call it a night. But here's where things go sideways. In that shoulder to shoulder crowd, somehow, Mark slips away from his pack. His friends make it to the border. They look around, they wait, nothing. They retrace their steps, hoping he'll show, but nothing. Dawn breaks, there's still no sign of Mark. They trek back to the car and return to their hotel on South Padre Island, just right across the border. So maybe he found his own way back, but there's no sign of him. That's when they know this is serious. It's time to get the cops involved. See, every March, South Padre Island in Texas basically transforms into the ultimate spring break hotspot. We're talking thousands of college students descending on this little resort town, turning it into this nonstop party zone. Imagine endless beaches, cold beers, thumping nightclubs, and yeah, those infamous wet t-shirt contests. It's just, it's wild. And guess what? Mark and his crew are here for it. They are all in. They are ready to dive headfirst into the madness. Now, normally, you couldn't get Mark out of the library. He's a junior at the University of Texas. He's only 21, just turned, but he's been planning a career in medicine since he was a kid. He's got the grades to do it, too. Plus, the looks and charm of a TV doctor straight out of Grey's Anatomy. But he's been so busy studying, his friends are like, Mark, buddy, put down the books. Come with us to South Padre for a few days. We'll have some fun. You'll relax. You'll go back to class and new man. So they kick things off on Friday, March 10th, 1989. They roll up to the Sheridan, drop their bags, and bam, they're straight into party mode. So after grabbing lunch, they're front and center at the daily Miss Tan Line contest classic. When night falls, they're off to Matamoros, Mexico for the real action. So the drill's pretty simple. You drive to Brownsville, Texas. It's only about like half an hour from where they are. You park near the border and then you just stroll across the bridge into Matamoros. The place is lined with bars and clubs where the drinks are dirt cheap. They've done this run before, no sweat. But on their second trip over, that's when everything just goes off the rails. It's a miracle they found Mark at all. On April Fool's Day, about two weeks after he went missing, this 20-year-old guy, they call him Little Seraphine. He's not exactly top of the food chain. He's just like this small-time dealer. Anyway, this guy blasts through a drug checkpoint into Matamoros like he's in some kind of action movie. And cops are on him in no time. They follow him about 20 miles out of town. A spot called Rancho Santa Elena. It's this rundown place with no real house to speak of. It's just a bunch of shacks, all owned by Little Seraphina's uncle, who just happens to be a big time drug lord because, you know, it's the family business. At first, the cops didn't connect little Seraphine with Mark's disappearance. They're just eyeing this ranch thinking, yeah, you know, I think we can get a big bust out of this. Well, another week or so goes by and they're kind of asking around what goes on at that ranch and they hear these creepy stories about black magic and the occult, plus, you know, the usual buzz about narcotics. So on April 11th, they start closing in, grabbing whoever's around, family, workers, you name it. And then the caretaker mentions seeing this young American guy all tied up in one of the sheds earlier, weeks earlier, but he doesn't know where he is now. Well, when they throw this piece of the puzzle at little Seraphin, the guy's as cool as a cucumber. Yeah, he says. He was part of the snatching of the American American, and no, he didn't make it. And then he drops this bombshell. This twisted voodoo they were into demanded human sacrifices. The power of the blood shielded them from the law. So when little Seraphim blew through the drug checkpoint, he thought he was invisible because of what they did to Mark. All right, buckle up because this part is a doozy. Little Seraphim, during this intense interrogation, describes luring Mark into their truck right off the street, all because their leader craved the blood of a gringo who had to go out screaming. They picked Mark because he sort of resembles their leader. The night that follows is pure 
horror. They torture him. They rape him. Then they cut off his head with a machete and boil his brains as part of the ritual. When the cops dig deeper, they hit the mother load of nightmares, the shack where Mark spent his last hours. Now, in the middle of the floor is the cauldron where they worked their spells. They eventually find the rest of Mark in a shallow grave nearby. His heart is torn out. His legs are cut off at the knees. They're just tossed on top of his body. But Here's the worst part. They replaced his spine with a wire to pull his bones out after he decomposed. The ends of the wire are sticking up through the dirt so they know where he is. They believe that wearing parts of his spine, like some kind of twisted necklace, will make them invisible. And Mark isn't the only tragic story tied to that place. 14 more victims were buried all over the ranch. Among them is a Mexican police officer who'd vanished into thin air a few months back. He'd been boiled alive with his skin peeled off. Now, when the news hit, people started calling them the narco-Satanists. The group had set up shop on this ranch, using it as a base to smuggle all sorts of illegal stuff into the U.S. The big boss behind all this madness was a guy named Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo, a Cuban-American guy from Miami, raised by this mom who was obsessed with some seriously dark stuff. Well, Adolfo grew up to be a very good student of hers and an even better-looking man. So his looks took him to Mexico. Mexico City, chasing work as a model. But here's the twist. His real cash cow wasn't in front of the camera. It was all about the occult. He starts this business offering up supernatural protection. Yeah. You heard that right. And the city's bigwigs line up for his services, people on both sides of the law. They're all shelling out big bucks to have Odolfo do his thing, sacrificing animals to keep the bad juju at bay. But then Odolfo decides to take it further. He gets deep into some seriously dark magic, the kind you can't just pull off with a chicken or a goat, the kind that needs human blood. So as his popularity grows, so does his crew of psychopaths, most of them from middle to upper class families. They're drawn to this power he says he can offer. One girl works her way up the rings to become his high priestess, Sarah Aldrete. On the surface, she's got it all. Good looks, a loving family, and she's smart. She's about Mark's age. She's in college, studying physical education in South Texas. She's even a cheerleader. But under that polished exterior, she's nick deep in cartel connections and obsessed with the occult. Her favorite movie is The Believers. It's this low-budget horror movie about human sacrifices and voodoo that came out in 1987. It was mandatory watching for their crew. Now, fast forward a year, and it's like they're making that movie reality. Adolfo's gang is out there grabbing people left and right off the streets, dragging them into nightmares you can't even imagine. Now, some were random, like Mark, but others were revenge killings from competing cartels, but none of their victims got the mercy of a quick ending. Exactly how many victims there were is still a mystery. In the three months before Mark was snatched, at least 60 people just up and disappeared around Matamoros. If Adolfo and his crew were responsible for those, we may never know because he never made it to trial. He was hiding out in an apartment in Mexico City with Sarah and a few other loyal followers. Police finally hunted them down thanks to a tip in May. Now, as they closed in, he starts throwing money out the windows, shooting wildly, screaming, you'll never get my money. And before they can arrest him, he orders his own followers to shoot him and his right-hand man. Thanks. Thanks, boss. But when the smoke clears, they're both out of the picture for good. Now, five members of his crew were convicted on multiple charges, including Sarah. They got between 30 to 60 years each behind bars. But some sources say Sarah is already out and living in San Antonio. Now, meanwhile, back home in Santa Fe, Texas, Mark's folks don't just sit back. They turn their grief into action with the nonprofit aimed at battling substance abuse, all in Mark's memory. It's their way of keeping the spirit of their son alive. The honor student with dreams of becoming a doctor whose life was cut short by a gang of drug traffickers. Even now, 35 years down the line, his friends and family still tell the story of Mark Kilroy as a warning to students gearing up for spring break on the border. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time. 
take care.